it's actually I've lost just over three kilos of fat. I've gained, I've lost a kilo body weight, but I've gained a couple of kilos of muscle. So somebody said to me, well, what about fasting for a few weeks as a self-experimenter? So I said, okay, let's do that. But actually, that was just me talking to me. So. <laughs> On the 12th of January last year, I thought I'd start this fasting. That was a picture of me on day one, and I was uh, weighed in at 67 kilos. So let's get started, and it's a bit about what coffee can do for us, and a bit about what diet can do for us, especially low carb and a high fat diet, as you see, and if you've seen the poster. So I'm going to start with a few statistics. Um, this is going back about two and a half years. That was my statistics of my my weight the amount of body fat I had and at the time I was into long distance running and as you can see I was running quite a bit, quite a bit. and just the other day this is my statistics now and what I'm doing I'm using I'm doing less than one hour of exercise per week but looks what happens to my my weight is actually lower than when I was long distance running my body fat's lower. If we put those statistics side by side, that's how it comes out. See, my weight's about the same. I'm a little bit lighter today, but my body fat has gone down by a third at least, and my muscle mass has actually increased. So if we do that calculation, it's actually I've lost just over three kilos of fat. I've gained, I've lost a kilo body weight, but I've gained a couple of kilos of muscle. But as we go through tonight, just keep in mind that everything I do is in what we call an N of 1 trial. So it's all tested on myself, it's all my own experience. So it's probably a good time to show you my disclaimer. <laughs> At best, you know, I'm a self-experimenter who feel I'm onto a few sound principles that may work in some people. But disclaimer number two, because these principles have worked rather well for myself, I'm probably going to be a little bit biased too. So please keep those in mind as we go through tonight. So, let's get started. Recently, I went to this conference where they were serving coffee. But this is the picture of the guy making the coffee, and they were putting this thing called MCT oil into the coffee. And I was at that conference to interview this guy. He was one of the keynote speakers there. And when I interviewed him, lo and behold, he's drinking this coffee with this oil in. So, what is it about this MCT oil, it's called? And why would you put it into coffee? It doesn't really sound that appealing, does not You put fat into coffee. Well, it turns out that MCT is a special kind of fat. We'll come back to the coffee part, I promise. If you take coconut oil and you extract certain fatty acids, a certain type of fat out of that, you can get MCT oil. And there's now starting to be a few brands on the market. The one I showed you is one of them. I've got another one here tonight which is readily available in any health food shop. And if we look at what MCTs are, we go into Wikipedia, it's called Median Chain Triglycerides. And you can see the details there. But there's one in particular, those MCT fatty acids that are really interesting, called C8. And if we look close at that bottle, we can see it says C8 or caprylic acid. Am I starting to lose you at this point? <laughs> what the hell did I come out on Tuesday night for? <laughs> okay, more to the point though, why is this stuff on the market? Why is this stuff on the shelf? And actually, it has been for quite a long time. But now there's newer products coming out. Well, if we, look, if we read close on one of the bottles, it says optimized for ketones, which then begs the question, what are ketones? But it turns out that the C8 in the MCT is very good at making ketones. Okay, well, what are ketones? Ketones is basically made in your liver by fat. So if you have 
fat go through your liver, out the other side come ketones. Now that fat can be your body fat or from dietary fat. Okay? And MCT is special because it's very good at going through your liver and getting made into ketones. Don't worry, we'll get to the details. Now, so you find MCT fat or MCT oil in obviously the MCT oils you can buy in coconut oil because MCT is just an extract of coconut oil. But there's also to some degree MCT fat in dairy products. The point is though, why would the liver make this stuff? Well, the short answer is it does it to maintain energy levels. If you imagine this being your bloodstream, we all know about blood sugar, and the body pretty much tries to keep that in a pretty tight range, not too high, not too low, because that's our major energy source, or it can be. But if your blood sugar drops below minimum level, then the body can start making ketones to make up that energy deficit. So it's an energy molecule, basically. At least that's according to um, one of my favourite books of all time, which is this one here, an anatomy book. So it's you know one of those that are that thick. And when I tell people my favourite book, this is what they tell me. <laughs> so. Anyway, if we look inside that book, and this is a screenshot of basic fat metabolism. But does anybody ever wonder what that word actually means, metabolism? You know, we all throw it around, don't we? You've got a slow metabolism, we've got a fast metabolism. Well, let's look at the dictionary, and it's the chemical processes that occur within a living organism to maintain life. In other words, it's your body chemistry. Don't worry, I haven't got about coffee. If some of you just came just to hear the coffee part, we'll get into it. So, we can look at actually there's ketone metabolism. And if you see there, your at your fat storage, which is your fat tissue, technical terms, adipose tissue, you can see the fatty acids gets released from the fat. They go into your bloodstream, into your liver. Your liver makes ketones out of that fat. It goes back into the bloodstream, and then it can go to something like your heart and get used for energy. It's a basic energy pathway. Yeah. Been in all anatomy books probably for the last few hundred years. They don't tend to vary or change that much. But we can also see that those same fatty acids can go straight to your heart for energy. Okay, so you can actually use ketones or fatty acids for energy. And the same fatty acids can go to something like your muscles. Okay, this is just basic energy pathways out of an anatomy book. So if we have a, a food source that is providing you with blood sugar, uh, the sugar in your food, or the carbohydrates, and the fat in your food is you're providing you with fatty acids, then those two together, you can see, they can maintain energy levels, as we just saw in the anatomy book. Some of that food was also going into storage, into your sugar storage or your fat storage. Now, if that food source starts to drop, like just say in between meals, so you don't eat for a while, well, then you can start drawing on your storage. This is why we don't have to eat, you know, 24-7. We can actually have a little bit of time between meals because we can put some of it away for storage. And we can see, again, just that we can actually run quite well on just some fatty acids. Okay, they can maintain energy to your muscles and your heart. And not necessarily you have to use ketones. Okay, so, so what is the deal with these ketones? If your body can run without them, why do we make them from time to time? You know, what's so special about them? Well, it turns out ketones are special fuel for your brain. Again, if we go back to the anatomy book, and we can see the brain down the bottom there, we focus in on that, we can see there's another energy pathway, it says ketone bodies. So your brain, obviously, seems to be the main thing that wants to use ketones for energy. And we can see that there's actually no pathway for fatty acids. 
So your brain can't use fatty acids for energy. The only other thing you can use is glucose. So again, the fat comes out of your, your fat cells, gets broken down into fatty acids, and then it can go to your liver, get it made in ketones, and then go to your brain as an energy source. So you can just think of ketones as another fat, but your brain can now use it. So your brain can only run two fuels, blood sugar or ketones. It can't run on fatty acids. So can you now see why if your blood sugar drops, why ketones kicked in? It's simply just to maintain those energy levels. And if we look at my anatomy chart, it looks a bit like that in a nutshell. Okay? Blood sugar drops, your body starts making ketones to make up that deficit. Now if you're producing ketones, there's a name for that. Anybody know it beside Claire and Simon and anybody else? Yes. Exactly. Anybody heard of it in a negative sense? It usually comes up now. So that's why some of you might have heard of diabetic ketoacidosis. But what that is, it's, a, it's, it's where ketones actually get very high in your bloodstream. But if you go onto the Mayo Clinic's website, or any medical website, they'll describe it and what it is. So it's basically when you can't produce insulin, and this only happens in type 1 diabetics. So this will not happen in a normal human body. And we can even go on to the symptoms of, the, of ketoacidosis, which is high blood sugar level. Okay, so it's basically your body's not working, your blood sugars can't get out of the bloodstream, your ketones can't get out, and it's all toxic. So it's a very special situation, but only for, for type 1 diabetics. And down the bottom, you can see you're looking at a, a blood sugar of over 300, or 16, 17 millimolars, which is... So it's an extreme case. But what we're talking about, we're actually talking about ketosis, where you've got low blood sugar. Okay, so it's nothing like that, that situation. Anyway, if we look next to our brain in the anatomy book, it says starvation. So it seems like ketones and starvation has something to do with each other. If we look up what starvation is, it's basically if you don't eat, you're going to die eventually. So it looks like, or it seems like, ketosis is like this evolutionary survival mechanism, an inbuilt thing we have. And can you see how if you start to not be able to eat, you know, you, you can't get taken any sugar or even fat, you have to run on your, your, fat, your, your food stores or energy stores. And because you only have such a small sugar store, but a lot larger fat store, we then start converting some of that fat into ketones to keep feeding the brain. Does that all make sense? So could we speculate that ketosis may have served as well for millions of years? Could we sort of say that's speculation? Because there might not always have been a supermarket on each corner. Might have been days where we couldn't eat. We could even, I would even go as far as say ketones probably allowed us to survive for millions of years. But it's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? Millions of years when people say that. People go, yeah, yeah, right. Millions of years. How do you know? So somebody said to me, well, what about fasting for a few weeks? It's a self-experimenter. So I said, okay. Let's do that. But actually, that was just me talking to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and if we look at what fasting is in the dictionary, it's abstain from all or some food. Okay? So eat nothing, or at least eat very little. So if we fast, that should mimic the body's response to starvation. Would that be a fair sort of conclusion? Not eating, starvation. You're not starving, but you're not eating, so you should maybe get some of the same responses. And you should start converting some of those um, fatty acids into ketones when your sugar stores start to run out. And as you can see there... If we fast but don't starve, no sugar's coming in, we should start running on ketones. Okay. So, according to my, my little anatomy chart, 
We start fasting so there's no food coming into your bloodstream. First thing the body's going to do is start running off the stores, yeah? The sugar stores and the fat stores. It's going to release fatty acids. As you can see, the little guy at the bottom, that's your heart. He's happy running on that. Little sun there over the arm, that's your muscles. He's also happy running on fatty acids. And the brain up there, he says, I'm good because he's getting a little bit of blood sugar. That's sort of straight after you think that's almost, you know, you haven't fasted for very long at this stage. But you keep doing that, even your stores are going to start running low, aren't they? They're going to start coming down. So pretty soon, you haven't got very much blood sugar. You can't store very much. So pretty soon, the brain is going to go, I'm not happy at all. But you can see how the heart and the muscles, they're fine. But it doesn't really matter how much, how well your heart and muscles are going. If your brain is not getting energy, that's it, end of story. But according to what we just talked about, it should then start to work something like that. Ketones should start getting made, and then your brain should be happy again. All right? So it sort of makes a little bit of sense, doesn't it, that, that if we look back, you know, those millions of years, if we didn't have food for a few days, and you start to go and hunt. Well, you couldn't just lie down after two hours because you're hungry and couldn't function and couldn't get energy. It made sense there was sort of this system in place that you, you could actually draw on your reserves and function very well. And again, we just go back to, there's only two fuel sources for your brain. Glucose starts to get diminished. Ketones start to get amplified. So, on the 12th of January last year, I thought I'd start this fasting. And that was a picture of me on day one. And I was uh, weighed in at 67 kilos. And, you know, I just sort of looked into this stuff and, and read a bit of anatomy and, and listened to a few people and, and hoping it would work like I sort of thought it would work, basically like we just talked about. Okay, as those stores start to come down, I shouldn't just die. I should actually mm -hmm. start to get this energy. For These ketones were supposed to be amazing for energy too. Now, fasting could be abstained from all or some food. I did actually have coffee during the, the time. So I had one or two cups of coffee a day with a little bit of cream. So I probably did have 50 or maybe 100 calories a day. And you see that little meter here? That's actually to measure the level of ketones in your blood. Okay, I've got one here tonight. So I'm just going to show you how that works. So that's actually how you know whether you're in ketosis. It's actually what the type 1 diabetics use, that's what the, it's developed for, because they're trying to see if these rise too high, then they want to keep an eye on that. So, but I'm actually looking for the opposite, I'm trying to keep mine relatively high. So, let just see what they are. So you just get a little blood sample. And you can buy these at the can they're about thirty, forty dollars. Um, and the strips are about somewhere between seventy cents and a dollar. And I'll probably I do this most days, so I'm two point three. Okay. So that's a fair level of, of ketones in your blood. Now I have eaten today, um, so I'm not fasting, I'm not starving, but the food I eat allows me to produce ketones. Okay, so the food I eat produces very little blood sugar. Because that's what I'm trying to do. I believe they're a very good fuel to run your body on. But as you can see, we're not talking about high, high levels. These are very low levels. Okay. So after 16 days of doing this, one or two cups of coffee a day, I weighed in at just over 60 kilos. And that's what I looked like then. So basically I lost 10% of my body weight. Now the first, I was actually in Thailand at the time, the first presentation I did, a guy said, oh, did you lose muscle? It looks like you, you lost muscle. Well, I don't know. I just weighed myself, took these photos. There's no way to really know unless you do what you call a body composition test. 
But I would argue I didn't because during that fast, uh, for the first five days, I still trained and I ran these hill sprints. And I actually ran faster on day five than I did on day one. So five days with no eating, I could run faster. So I thought, well, there's something going on here. You know, your body can obviously function well with that food for quite a long time. And on the 16th day, I did this. I did a handstand for longer than I ever have in my life. And this is actually at, a, at the top of a mountain. I used to do a hike every morning. And it's like a 25-minute hike up. And then I'd do, you know, some other bit of yoga stuff. So I would actually do a fair amount of exercise morning and night. And I did that all through the fast. And I probably I felt here in day 16, you know, I don't think I would have been able to do that if I'd lost muscle. If I was breaking down my muscle tissue, I don't think I would have had the strength to do that. So, at least in me, it seems like this fat metabolism works quite well while fasting. And if you go to my website, I've written extensively about this particular period. Um, I wasn't measuring ketones, but I was measuring blood sugar. And there's even something about what I ate afterwards and how I maintained that state of ketosis after I finished fasting and why. But again, please remember, I am just a single person. I only tried this in myself. So, so far we talked about how ketones are probably a safeguard against starvation. And if you fast, that mimics that response. Okay, so we actually get this inbuilt response by just abstaining from a bit of food for some time. And when glucose diminishes like fasting, ketones are produced and you can lose weight. And you can lose about 10% in about 16 days, according to this trial. So who's exciting about fasting for weight loss, if anybody has that desire to weight lose? I didn't really see anybody jump up and down and go, yes. And <laughs> so I thought you might say something like this. Look, the weight loss sounds great, but the 16 days fasting, no way. So what you're really saying is that, look, I'll take the 10%, forget about the 16 days. Would that be a right and fair statement? Not that anybody, I'm not saying anybody needs to lose weight, but... <laughs> Just that little caveat or disclaimer. Advertisers talk where we're going to talk about coffee as well, how that makes it help to stay lean. So what is it about coffee that's so special? And the other one, why is coffee and diet, how can that help you to burn body fat? So go back to what I was doing. This was actually after my fast. Um, you can see I would drink coffee and then two hours later my ketones would, would rise. And that's fairly consistent even to this day. So coffee somehow assists with, with the state of being in ketosis or helps you get there. Anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> well his name is Dave Asprey and but you might have heard of Bulletproof Coffee. Anybody heard of that? The coffee where you put the butter in? Um, there's actually a few places in Adelaide. He's worldwide. He's sort of got a bit of a movement going. Um, but he sort of invented this sort of coffee that you would put... He's got a whole story behind it, how he's in Nepal, and he was trekking, and he had this tea with, with yak fat in, and it gave him all his energy. And then he came back home, and he thought, oh, I could maybe do the same with coffee, and it works really well. And um, But the basic is that you put some fat in, in your coffee, and that gives you energy. And he's actually got a, a product on the market, that's his MCT oil, um, and you can buy that here in Australia. It's actually probably one of the more pure ones, I think. So what we're actually looking at is that you put this stuff into coffee, then the coffee takes that fat to your liver, and it makes ketones. That's sort of the, the idea really behind it. That's how it gives you energy. So basically we, we compare that, we say we have a fat storage and your sugar stores and your food stores start to drop, then it would draw on those fat stores and some of that fat would make ketones. Okay? 
But we can also just drink the coffee with the fat. So it's just doing the same thing. But what's the advantage actually to to the coffee and then if you say, okay, this ketosis Ollie, that sounds great. How can it help you sort of sort of get there? Yeah, if you've been using blood sugar as your main energy source most of your life, then it may not be that good at fat metabolism at this point in time. And if you start having a diet, which we'll talk about in a minute, that run that, that where it's running mainly on fat, there's a few changes that need to take place in your body first before it gets really good at that. But what MCT does is that it's one of the most quickly absorbed and digested fats. So you can run on that and sort of get your body trained in, in a really easy way. But we still really haven't answered the question, have we? We're still sort of biting around the edge. I was told about MCT oil again. So where does coffee fit in? Well, if you go on PubMed, which is where you can read medical papers, which is also what I do in my spare time, <laughs> um, we can see there that in one trial, caffeine accelerates the absorption. And this was, if we go and look a bit closer, it's something like, you know, Tylenol or Panadol. So they actually put caffeine in, and the theory is that it absorbs better. So maybe that's the mechanism behind, say, Bulletproof or fat coffee, is that it actually makes you absorb and use that fat better. It could be one mechanism. Yeah? It's all pretty much speculation when you start looking into it, but I can see that it, in, in this body it, it definitely works. So it says coffee and low carb, high fat food. Okay, well, what or high fat diet? So, what does low carb, high fat food look like? Well, it could look something like this. Okay, some of you might have tasted it here tonight. It's a product we make. Um, but if we go on, go on the back of those packets, and we look at the actual nutrition information, well, if it's low in carbohydrate, you can see there's not very many carbohydrates per 100 grams. So it's about 4.5% of carbohydrates in one of those packets we got here tonight. But we can see there's about 23% or 23 grams per 100 grams of fat. So that's a typical high fat, low carb, or low carb, high fat food. And you could turn any label over like that, okay? So basically, if you're eating low carb, high fat, you're eating less carbs and more fat. Okay, it's a pretty straight equation. One goes down, the other one goes up. You've got to get your energy from somewhere. But your protein stays pretty much the same. I would even say over time it starts to drop off. So how does that work, this low carb, high fat diet and coffee? So is anybody excited about more body chemistry? Yes. I've got one person. <laughs> And the rest sort of feel a bit like this? <laughs> well, <coughs> for those who said yes, you need to get out more. <laughs> yes, <it's> so, true. <laughs> so I'm going to try and explain another way. Um, I'm going to tell you about my story and how, how I came to this. Okay, so my story is that I found out about this sort of high fat thing um, because I was doing long distance running at the time. If we go back to 2013, I just finished my, um, my fourth ultra marathon, 85 kilometers, and this photo was taken in Mexico in March 2013. And by April, about a month later, that's when I first heard about this. And it sounded pretty interesting. And it was in this book called The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance. And it's written by a guy called Jeff Volek and his colleague Stephen Finney. Stephen Finney is pretty much sort of the, I would say, a founding father of this what you call nutritional ketosis. I think he even coined the term uh, when you look at the science. And... What he's talking about there is actually you maintain this state of ketosis through your diet. Like I just measured my ketones now. It's not because I'm, I'm starving and fasting. I have an energy source that allows my body to produce ketones in a fed state, so to speak. 
So what they were saying in their book when I was reading this and I was into running, they were basically saying that, look, you have a very small sugar storage, but you have this huge fat storage. And those two together is your fuel tank. And I thought, huh. Well, I can probably run a lot further without eating. It's a bit of a problem when you run 85 kilometers. You need to take in some calories. And it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a as Wendy would know, Wendy just ran 100 kilometers the other week. But it can be a bit of a problem, you know, activity and then eating at the same time. They don't go that well together. So I thought this would be really handy. So I started looking into this and went to my old friend in the Manabu book and it, it actually showed there how, how little sugar we can store. We can only store a little bit, about one third in the liver or what, a quarter, and about three quarter of our whole storage is in the muscles. Or about, as it says there, 125 grams in the liver and 375 in the muscles. So if you're running 85 kilometers, you've got obviously the bigger sugar stores in your muscles and a small little bit of sugar that can go to your brain. Now can you see how there's no connection from the muscles, the sugar stores to the brain? It just goes to the muscles. Because the sugar in your muscles stays, can only be used in your muscles. It can't be used in the rest of your body. So if you've got 125 grams to run your brain and the rest of your body. Now how far do you think that's going to get you? Not very far. <laughs> if that. So, but if you can add your fat stores to that, how far can you go then? You can then, so to speak, you might still use sugar for your um, muscles, but now you can supplement that with the fat. Yeah? So you can sort of run on this dual fuel tank. Now that, that alone is going to get you further. And the, the, the sugar in your liver can get supplemented by the ketones produced from your fat as you start to break that down. So now you've got a big, big uh, fuel tank for your brain as well. And it turned out though that at that point in time I had a bit of an advantage for trying to convert my body to burn it running on fat. Because 10 or 15 years before that, somebody gave me this book, Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. Anybody heard of that book? It's about traditional cooking and how we used to prepare food. Um, it's a bit of a, a sort of a story as well. It goes through all the ingredients and how they work in the body and basic explanation, basically, you know, fat, carbohydrates and protein are. And... But anyway... I end up reading about eggs, and this is what I read. I won't read it all to you, but it was sort of right up my alley, okay, because the first line almost said, high cost of food wrongly believed to cause coronary heart disease. So it was sort of controversial already, so that was said what I was into. But then it said, you know, rich in just about every nutrient, that sort of went, wow, so this guy was one food that's got everything you need? That's pretty cool. And, but the last line, I remember that for some reason that's stuck in my head. It maintains the integrity of the cell membranes. I thought that, that sounds like a pretty cool thing. So what I did, I started eating 30, 40 eggs a week. Can I say something more? Yes. When I was pregnant from Nicholas, I had a really bad morning sickness. The only thing I could eat were hard boiled eggs, and I would have seven eggs every day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, because my thought was, it was that, well, if I just eat enough eggs, then I'll be okay. All right? I'm not that smart, but if that's correct, I'll just do that. I'll just make sure I do that every day. So, that's what, about six eggs a day or, or more. So going back to, uh, going forward again to 2013, I started increasing my fat intake from six eggs a day. And I was living in Europe at the time, and this is what, it start, this is what my diet pretty much looked like up until, until then, till before I increased my fat intake. So you can see it didn't look too bad, did it? That's pretty much everything there, but um, it's even coconut oil, 
that there is like a similar product to what you tasted here tonight. If you tasted like a that's a liver pate. You got some cheese. You got some sausage. You got butter. So I was I was already into the whole food thing. But basically, what you do again when you go low carb, and higher fat, you pretty much replace more of those carbohydrates with fat. So this is the basically the foods I'm cut out: bread. Uh, you see, there's beetroot there. Under there is potatoes. Um, I cut out sausages because they sometimes contain flour. Um, but everything else is pretty reasonable, high fat. You know, the eggs, of course, uh, the, the butter, the cheese, the pate, the coconut oil. You see something like cauliflower is a very low carbohydrate um, food. Pretty much anything that, that grows above the ground is going to be the lowest in, in, in sugar. And anything that's in the ground, like carrots, potatoes, and beetroot, they're going to be high sugar content. So if you're trying to do this, low carb, high fat, you want to stay away from those. But anyway, I thought I'd really go to town on this, so I went to the butcher and you can get this smoked fat. So I would get smoked fat, I would put that in a wok with some ginger, sizzle that up, put some other herbs in there, and then when that was sort of sautéed for a while, I would add as much kale or, or silver beet or anything like that, and then I would boil that down and then I'd fill it up with full cream. Uh, whip, whipping cream and then I would boil that down so as you can see there'd be a fair few fair bit of fat in that it was pretty much fat but there's actually also a lot of fiber looking what I know about today we're talking about fiber because I stuffed as much green as I could in there and there's probably I think also mushrooms in there and so but pretty much zero carbohydrates of so fat and and fiber and what I would do I would have that for my dinner with a couple of eggs on top of course maybe some beans few raw carrots, or I would have a couple of eggs, uh, that's my fat dish there on the right. I would even have raw meat at times if I knew where the meat came from. I wouldn't dare try that with anything from Coles or Woolworth. Um, it could be my fat dish with some fish, that's a piece of salmon, and some other uh, fish there, some raw carrot. Now it, it seems like if you eat something like raw carrot, even though it's, it's reasonably high in, in um, blood sugar, in, not in blood sugar, in glucose, it doesn't seem to affect you that much. It's a bit like if you don't juice it and just keep the sugar, if you eat it with the fibre, it doesn't affect you too much. And that would be my dessert, about 10 cherries and some heavy cream. So very, very little, that was a bit about the only fruit I, I would eat. And at the time, I was running about 100, up to 140 kilometers a week. So I was spending a fair few hours doing that. And I was working full time. So I would sometimes get up at 4 in the morning and run. And I would do things like run for 3 hours, dragging a tyre. Which again probably meant that I need to get out more. <laughs> I felt at the time that I was getting out a fair bit with my, me and my tyre. Not socially. <laughs> yeah, not, not socially. <laughs> but I would do that before breakfast. Right? I would do that with, without eating and without eating during my run. So I could feel that there's something going on here. I had a stint where it was at the same time, a bit later on that year, I was in uh, New York. I would run around Manhattan Island before breakfast. I still not come back and be like totally wiped out. And then about June, I had my sort of what I felt like my running was improving and, and um, you know, I've been doing this diet for what, three months? And I ran a, a half marathon uh, in 126. Now it's not world record breaking, but it's sort of up there with, with some of the best amateurs. Uh, that was a race in, in, uh, of about 20,000 people, and that brought me into the top 200. Um, so it's sort of, if you gauge against the, say, the general running population, it, it's up there towards the better half. So my fat metabolism seemed to be working fairly well. You know, I was supplying, I was getting this energy supply from this low-carb, high-fat diet, making ketones for my brain, making 
fatty acids to my muscles and my heart and the rest of my body, but still enough glucose to if my brain needed some of that to run on too. But as you see, everything was running mostly on fat. However, though, I was drawing inspiration for all that running from this guy, my grandfather. And that's him winning the marathon in Denmark in 54. Um, two years before that, though, he'd made it to the Olympic, the Olympic Games. And um, his best time for the marathon ever was 2 hours, 40 minutes and 41 seconds. So that sort of became a quest for me. That was uh, my inspiration to get up and drag a tyre for three hours. Um, and in the meantime, I was also sort of becoming a bit bit of a geek, a bit of a high-fat geek. And I was sort of anything I could get my hands on and read and listen to on YouTube. Um, and I actually looked up what a geek is in the dictionary, so it's <laughs> a socially inept person. Or, the one I like is the one below, you know, knowledgeable, knowledgeable and obsessive enthusiast, like a high-fat geek. It actually said computer geek in the dictionary, but I put that in there if you hadn't guessed. There's a photo of you in the next Oxford dictionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it, yeah. <laughs> okay, so one of the first books I read that year after I read the, the first one, uh, Low Carbohydrate Performance, was this one called Grain Brain. It's written by a neurologist uh, called Dr. David Perlmutter. And if you read his book, he talks about what happens to the brain if you're mainly running on carbohydrates compared to if you're running on fat. So he's really interested in how your brain, how your nerve tissue works, but he obviously talks about the whole body because everything works together. But it turns out, as we mentioned at the start, that ketones are actually a really, really like a super fuel for your brain. And that's why when, when I do any of these talks or anything where it's, if you're in ketosis, you can just focus your, your brain. And it can produce a lot more energy per se molecule than a sugar molecule. So it's also very, very efficient energy. So that was in his book. He's since written more books. Um, but what, what at the cornerstone of what he does is still um, the low carb, high fat diet. And I end up meeting him uh, end of uh, 2013 at his home in Florida where he. We got some photos taken, and he actually wrote about me on his website, about what I was doing with long-distance running. Um, and that day that photo was taken, we were also in his backyard interviewing him, because I was in the America at the time, and I had some friends in the film industry, and they thought this quest sounded really cool, so they said, well, why don't we try and film some of this and make it into a movie? So that's how we ended up at, in Dr. Perlman's backyard. So that was why it was called, the movie's going to be called 24041, because that was the quest I was on. Unfortunately, though, the movie never eventuated. But, this one back, I did get a trailer made before we, um, we stopped the project, and that was going to be a, a trailer for a crowdfunding campaign. So, but it sort of explains pretty much how I want the way I wanted this thing to go at the time. So it's only three minutes long, so I'll let you you watch that. is your friend. You get into a state that's called ketosis. Good, good, good. Keep it up. Wow. Everything looks great, Olaf. Just keep pushing Excellent. through. You can take this to the bank. Olaf's going to validate the whole notion of a high-fat, low-carb, ketogenic type of diet. In 1952, my grandfather qualified for the Olympic marathon. 
He did it in a time of 2 hours, 40 minutes and 41 seconds. Now, I'm on a quest to match his time and hopefully break it. Now back in 1992, the US government issued a doctrine that we should all be low fat or no fat. And within 10 years, rates of diabetes in America went up threefold. Doctors have been telling you for years that you've got to cut out the fat. Absolutely nonsense. Olaf has adopted this incredibly powerful lifestyle and dietary program, really mimicking what humans have eaten for a couple million years. And when you look at the metrics, as demonstrated from his work up at the University of Florida, it's over the top breathtaking. He's got this incredible physiology now, really based upon this dietary shift away from carbohydrates and favoring dietary fat. Everything lands or loads very nicely. Very efficient running. Your metabolism looks great. Okay. Three, two, one, and let's bring you down. Okay, he's hanging on. How hard were you working How hard were you? Olaf has done a great job with his conditioning and his nutrition. Your maximum heart rate was 192. You've got perfect heart, no indication of any heart disease whatsoever. You exceeded 70, which is, is quite astounding. That's fantastic. For 99.9% .9 of our time on this planet, we didn't have sources of carbohydrates. People say, well, give us this day our daily bread. It's in the Bible. We've always had bread. Not true. What really surprised me is how long you were able to hang on to using fat for fuel. We know that Olaf's eating a lot of eggs, 30 to 40 eggs per week. <laughs> eggs contain saturated fat. We've all been told to avoid saturated fat and nothing could be worse for us. We desperately need saturated fat. Thank you for watching my short film and I'd really be excited if you could help me finish this project. Take the sugars and carbs out of the human diet revisit the idea that we need fat and we'll once again experience good health. So there you go, that was my movie career. <laughs> uh, but, so yeah, that never eventuated, but I sort of stayed in contact with um, Dr. Perlmutter a little bit. And recently he was uh, in Sydney for a conference last month and he agreed to do an interview with me, which is what we did. And that's the photo you saw at the start. So that's him, him there. So I caught up with him and uh, I was supposed to have about 40 minutes with him. I got about 10. It seems to me after reading uh, not only Grain Brain but Brain Maker and then uh, attending your lectures here at the symposium that that... Uh, low carb, high fat is still like the cornerstone of what you do? It is, and I think that what we're leveraging now is not just the notion of lowering carbohydrates and simple sugars and adding in more fat, but the big thing we really need to push now is fiber, oddly enough. Okay. And you know, the average American consumes about five grams a day of prebiotic fiber. It's been estimated that our Paleolithic ancestors consumed as much as 125 grams a day. The reason that's important is because now we're talking about nurturing the gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a neat little interview. Um, he's, he's a really cool guy and, and uh, it was a conference for mainly uh, physicians and doctors and naturopaths and that sort of thing. But I, I kid you not, anybody could sit in his lectures and, un, and understand that he's a really good communicator. Um, and he just brings everything together so it's really tangible. So I'll have that interview up on, on my website and YouTube probably in the next week or so. Now I said he's since written um, other books. Uh, the latest one is Brain Maker. I highly recommend. Uh, he's now right into the, the gut biome, uh, how the gut affects everything and how the gut works. Uh, he actually talks a fair bit about coffee. And that's an article from his website. So... Um, He's got a lot of good information on, on there. So yeah, you might want to think about adding some coffee if you're not already a coffee drinker. And they make some excellent coffee right here. So two weeks before we um, were in Dr. Perlmutter's backyard interviewing him, we were just up the road at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And that's probably what you saw in the video. And they sort of agreed to come on board and, and, and they liked the idea of this project so um, they sort of really put me through some tests to see where I was at. 
And the main test they put me through was a VO2 max test. And this is a clip, uh, a screenshot from, as you saw, I was on, the, on this treadmill uh, during the, the filming. So they put you on a treadmill and they pretty much start you low effort and then they keep putting the speed and incline up on that treadmill until you can't go anymore or until you say stop or until they stop it. So there's, there's really no end. Um, so you're really trying to see what, what your body's capable of. It's also called a, a stress test, uh, if anybody heard about that. But the main thing it, it, it measures is your ability to take in oxygen and then distribute that throughout your body. So it's a really good indicator of basically how your body's working. And if we look at uh, my category I was in at the time, I just turned 40, if the, my number uh, was above 48, I'm sort of in the superior range. And you can see where it then goes down from there. Now, I don't know if you heard in the video, but my VO2 max was 70, which is up there. If you're an Olympic athlete, if you, you, they sort of said, oh, you've got to be at least 60. So it doesn't mean that you then have the capability of what some of this athlete. It just means that you might have, your body is working as well at carrying stuff, uh, especially oxygen around the body, as they are. You know, someone like uh, Cadell Evans, He's about 86, one of the highest ever measured, I think the highest since. But they were sort of going, well, where do you come from? You know, this is a human performance testing centre. They test, I don't know how many elite athletes they test, but they test, you know, a lot of good, good amateurs, so to speak. And they hadn't really seen anybody with 70, pretty much. So I felt pretty chuffed after that. Thought I might be doing something right. Now, did you notice this guy in the video and him looking at this screen? What do you think he's looking at on that screen? What's he look at monitoring? Your heart rate amongst other things. Yep, it's pretty much monitoring your heart. Right. right? And when you go into a test like that, there, there's three doctors in the room. And all the all Kevin was doing was glued to that screen. That's monitoring basically how my heart's working. Not in that shot. <laughs> yeah, no, he's not watching there. That's it. <laughs> and you're on this treadmill with this mask on. And another thing I, I didn't tell you, when I, that mask can also measure exactly what your body's burning, carbohydrates or fat. So I was standing there, put this on. They hadn't even started the treadmill yet, but it's obviously starting to come through the computer. And then the girl over here, she goes, holy shit, you're burning 100% fat standing still. And they just go to me, we want to battle bottle your metabolism. <laughs> so I was feeling pretty good before the test even started. You know. um, so what it basically does, yeah, it monitors your heart. All these sensors, it's basically because if you're stressing the body and, and you don't want your heart, heart to conk out. Okay, so every minute he's got to okay the test to go on and he's just watching that screen. Now, my maximum heart rate also was 192, which is fairly high because there's sort of a, a standard gauge is that, you know, our maximum heart rate is 220 minus our age. Um, I don't know how accurate it is. But anyway, if we gauge mine according to that, well, I still had a lot more capacity left in my heart than I should have at that age. You know, that was like the heart of a 28-year-old, according to the standard population, so to speak. So that made me feel pretty good too. And you might have heard Kevin say on the video, Olive's got a perfect heart, no sign of any heart disease whatsoever. But after we finished the test, and we're actually packing up that day, the filming and everything, he comes to me and he goes, Olive, there's something I want to show you. So I thought, uh-oh. So he pulls out a chart like that. This is not my chart, but... And, he's, and he explains to me what he's looking for. So this is when the heart opens and closes. And basically what I look for is any irregularity. You know, if you start, if you start, heart starts to become irregular or erratic, we, we stop the test. That's why I'm there. Okay, got it. So he said, see this, see this, see this. He said, the thing about yours is that, you know, some irregularity is quite normal. But he said, but your heart 
didn't even show one irregularity. He said it was like textbook perfect. And he'd never seen that either, and he's monitored a lot of hearts. So he said, what in the hell are you doing? Where did you come from? Well, now I felt really chuffed, you know. Um, so in summary, what they told me at a, at a high-end university in the States was that, look, you've got a VO2 max of 70, so you can distribute oxygen like there's no tomorrow. You know, your heart's still got the capacity of somebody much younger. There's no heart disease whatsoever, and there's not even an irregularity in your heart, which is quite normal. So... I was functioning pretty good, you know, especially my heart and lungs for a 40 year old amateur athlete. So I thought, well, gee, this quest is looking pretty damn good. But that was despite, you know, eating 30, 40 of these per week. High and saturated fat for 10 to 15 years. Because in that 10 or 15 years, we've pretty much been told. Cholesterol talks your blood vessels and gives us heart disease. This is the official statement by the Heart Foundation. And I know that because I just went on the, their website last week. If we read it, they actually say, Eating foods high in saturated fat and trans fats makes your blood cholesterol go up. And when there's too much cholesterol in your blood, it builds up in the walls of your arteries. Your arteries become narrowed and blood flow to the heart slowed down and blocked. So in other words, you eat saturated fat, makes cholesterol, clogs your vessels, and gives you heart disease. But that statement, it seems to conflict with the scientific method, at least according to this university. What is the scientific method? Well, again, we go back to our old friend, the Oxford Dictionary, Basically, how you do science. You know, science is not something you just pick out of thin air. It's a way of, it's a procedure, it's systematic, it's observation, it's measurement, it's experiment, it's testing, and then you make a hypothesis. Okay? It's not just what somebody thinks. Now, would this qualify as a scientific method, do you think? It's, pretty, it's a pretty accurate measurement of how your heart's working, doesn't it? And if a VO2 max is your ability to take in, in oxygen and distribute it, and mine was 70, well, that would by definition require unclogged arteries. So the thought that cholesterol clogs your blood vessels seemed to conflict, at least with my VO2 max 70. I can't really have both, can I? I can't have heart disease or clogged vessels and have a VO2 max of 70. To be fair, though, if you go on the Heart Foundation website, they do say some nice things about eggs. Most people don't need to worry about eggs and cholesterol. Eggs are very nutritious. So you can enjoy up to six eggs each week. Except I was having five or six times that. I was having that a day. So even if you look at that, I was still off the charts. But that was on top of you know, eating this sort of stuff. I showed you my fat dish, high in saturated fat, should clog my arteries, no matter what you do. But remember also, Kevin said some nice things about my heart, with no irregularity. So again, that it gives us heart disease, seems to conflict with what Kevin's saying, in my opinion, the scientific method. So... Can you see why at least I'm sceptical about this statement? So personally, I'm way beyond fat phobia according to the scientific method because I've had it tested in myself. And if you go on my website, you'll see that's my tagline, metabolic performance beyond fat phobia. And what I mean by that is that Honestly, there's not much point in talking to me or reading my stuff if you're interested in this unless you're sort of beyond that fat phobia. Because I've just seen how much there is to explore on this side. But if you're still worried about the, the, the fat, uh, it, it, this is the other side of that because there's still a lot to learn over here. 
But also remember, <coughs> I am just that trial of one. Okay? So don't let me get too carried away. And again, let's not forget about we are in a coffee place and we did advertise about coffee. As I showed you there, I've measured several times that you put, that was actually cream in the coffee I was having at the time. Two hours later, my ketones would be up. And I was in a pretty high state of ketosis already. 2.6 is higher than what I am now. But then have a cup of coffee and it would go up to 4.2. But this is some of my notes another day. And this is just with black coffee. And you can see at 8.12, it was 2.1. Had, had some black coffee. And it went up there in a couple of hours. So it seems like there is something about coffee, even just black coffee. Not to, even if you have it without the MCT oil and butter and cream. There might be something to just coffee itself. I don't know what the mechanism is. But it seems to be very consistent, at least in me.